So last time I made a complete dog's breakfast for getting the interrupt system up and running, but I did eventually end up with a working system timer. Uh, while I was offline, I did a little bit of cleaning up, so it now correctly calculates the clock frequency, or at least probably correctly calculates the clock frequency from the PLL configuration, uh, then uh, calculate the prescale and comparator value and it all does seem to work. Uh, I have just restarted the system we got the mysterious splash screen again. I believe this is because the system is just powered on and it doesn't contain the various magic numbers that detect a warm boot. So I think that's normal and we won't get the splash screen again until I power the machine off. But now we've reached the point where given that we have interrupts working and we can't yet like interact with the thing so I'm going to have to get the serial port interrupt working because Emu Tosser's interrupt system is entirely sorry, Emu Tosser's serial system is entirely interrupt driven. This should hopefully, crossing fingers, not be that bad at least not as bad as the timer so, looking up the data sheet at the UART registers, we want to enable uh, the UART to create to generate an interrupt on, on the appropriate conditions, and then we want to enable the interrupt in the uh, interrupt mask, and we also and we want to do this one first, add the interrupt handler vector. So, uh, to enable the interrupt, the UART on this thing actually has a reasonable size FIFO. I think it's 16 bytes, could be 8 bytes. So, we could deal with data in batches. Uh, there are a number of uh, conditions you can enable. Uh, here we go, the, re the receiver enable bits. Receive a full sense and interrupt when the FIFO is full and any more characters will be dropped. That indicates that something bad's happened. Half enable enables an interrupt when the FIFO is more than half full. So if I use this, then uh, I would not get an interrupt until four or eight characters show up, and then I would I would process them all in a chunk. Uh, don't really want to do that because that raises nasty edge cases where if a single uh, character arrives is it just going to sit around in the FIFO until more show up. Uh, however if we do implement this it, you end up with much more efficient handling of high bandwidth data. However the simplest one is this one RXRE receiver ready enable which generates an interrupt when the FIFO is not empty, that is, it's got at least one byte. So that is bit three. So UST cunt one or equals uh, enable bit three. Okay. Uh, the next thing is the IMR, so let's find the IMR register, interrupt mask, we want UART1, which is bit 2. So to enable this, we need to clear the bit. Okay, and I will actually just go down to the status register again and check the sense of this bit. Uh, yes, that wants to be a 1. Now, back to the interrupt stuff. I did eventually figure out where the documentation for the uh, the interrupt levels for the various hardware, which is inside the documentation for the 
interrupt status register. Nowhere else, just here. So UART1 bit 2. UART1 interrupt request. When set, uh, the UART1 module needs service. This is a level 4 interrupt. So level 4, we're just going to do uh, bet user 4 equals Dana int 4. Um, in fact, uh, in fact, I think we can use OX18 for this, but let's make this work first. And I believe this is all the setup that needs to happen. So the next thing is to implement our Dana 4 interrupt handler. So that should go here. So there is an interrupt handler. However, uh, this is not actually going to read anything from the UART and therefore the interrupt will continue to be asserted forever. So we actually need to do some work. Now, for a normal interrupt handler, we need to save some registers. Let's take a look at the Amiga interrupt handlers. Here we go. Amiga interrupt keyboard interrupt is no that initializing the interrupt. Here we go. So this is saving these registers. So let's just do that. Uh, D naught D two A naught A one minus S P. And reading everything back again is in fact given that you can use this addressing mode why have we bothered with an LEA here I don't think we don't need that so we should be able to do that instead okay so this should save enough registers to let us do C stuff so uh, the next thing we want to do is to, hang on, we don't want keyboard, we want serial. CIA, CIA, a serial interrupt. Uh, now at this point we could call out to C to do the rest of it. But I think we don't need to. That is, in fact, all way too complicated because the, the Amiga CIA serial interrupt is also emulating a keyboard as well as just the serial port. So you can see this stuff here about converting it to a scan code. Okay. Um, here we go. Nope, no, that is again the keyboard handler. Okay, I'm going to have to figure out what this is actually, what we actually need to call. Presumably one of the routines in here What we need to do is to read the value from the serial port, which actually we can do easily. With this. Uh, let me think. 
So we could just read the the byte like this. However, I think we do want to check to make sure there is in fact a valid byte available. So if we read the whole thing and then we check bit 13 of it and if it is zero we skip to the end. Uh, this means that if any stray interrupts show up we won't end up producing garbage serial data. Uh, now we want to Is this it? I think it is, you know. But we are going to... No, wait, that's a static function. Ah, what am I doing? Let's just go look at the cold fire code, which is probably more straightforward. Here we go. Right, this is much more straightforward. This is more along the lines of what we want. Ah, I know why this code is using an explicit LEA and uh, multi-register read and write. It's because the cold fire is a cut down 68,000 and doesn't have those addressing modes. So yes, we can do this, but this will work too. Right, so this is effectively the same code that we've got here. Uh, so now we want to go look at the interrupt handler. Enable interrupt, here we go. Uh, So, while there are no pending data bytes, get the byte and this is for the keyboard and this one is for the serial. So all we want to do is to push D0 All push serial IO rec. Uh, do I need to pop that value off? I think I probably do. So that's going to be uh, add QL four to SP. and then branch back to here so that any more data continues to get pushed. And that should be our serial interrupt handler. Of course it doesn't work. Because we need to prototype it here. We will eventually, probably, have to deal with multiple different types of interrupt on the same interrupt vector, but we don't have to go there yet, which is nice. Uh, UST control one is a word, I believe 902, 90, 900. Okay. Really? It's yep, I know what I did. This platform prepend C symbols with an underscore. There you go. And I just think I should check one thing. Do any of these functions uh, I 
don't don't think that is used. I just want to make sure I've got the calling convention right. Uh, let's just enable this because I want to know what size of value gets pushed onto the stack when you pass bytes. And the answer is Uh, it's a word, which is what I thought. Okay, so build. Reset. Right, and let's see what happens. All right, execute. Okay, apparently if I do control Z, I should get something. Uh, maybe not. Yeah, I would kind of expect more than this. So let's see if there's some tracing we should turn on. Apparently it's already on there. So this is where data actually shows up. So let's just make sure that happens. Okay, execute and bah, nothing showing up. Okay, that means something somewhere is wrong. It's not really a surprise to anybody. So, I would guess that this interrupt is not being called for some reason. So we're probably setting it up incorrectly. Okay, USD cunt one. Uh, Bit three is RXRE, receiver ready enable. Enables an interrupt when the receiver has at least one data byte in the FIFO. Okay. Do I need to enable the receiver? Probably not, because the download pr process has that. And we don't want to fiddle with that configuration as if we can help it. Anything else we need? I don't believe so. All right, IMR, mask register. Bit two is UART one. And it needs to be set to a zero, which I believe that is doing. Uh, vec user 4 should be the right vector. If an interrupt has been generated on the wrong vector, as we know before, we will probably end up with a crash or a hang, depending what's going on. Is bit 2. You want one interrupt request. Level 4. Level 4. So, is Dana RS232 init being called? Well, well, 
Well, if in its serial port, then yes. I don't think I've made any typos there. So that will tell us if anything is being um, if it's being set up correctly. One other thing that might have happened is that there are no drives and therefore it's failed to reach the command prompt due to being confused because there are no drives. Uh, let's just see where that string shows up. Is there? Yeah, is it? No surprises, it's a routine that turns an error code into a string. Yeah, I think it is plausible that that has failed. Uh, there was a th there was a setting I made, which is uh, which is not there. It's It's this. Uh, so I. This might be the thing that causes it to go straight to the console rather than going to the splash screen. So let's try taking that out and seeing what happens. It may be that that value is now no longer initialized, so we'll still get the old value. If that happens, if we get the same thing again, then I will reset it to zero and see what happens. And we write and see what happens. OK, that is interesting because we have not actually... Did I remember to build? Yeah, I did, because we haven't received any more tracing. Because I didn't enable it there, that's why. But it also hasn't uh, produced that splash screen. So let's try changing. Let's set this to zero. And I will actually, yeah, we do need to en enable this. Let's actually figure out where boot flags is used. Uh, what's this? Right, this is the splash screen. This is uh, this happens after all the init sequence. The init sequence is there. Okay, so we should be able to set it to something in Dana.c. Uh, splash screen, yeah, it's a thing called init info. which is called from here. Based on this flag. 
Do we want to show that? Possibly. Yeah, first boot is... Uh, it looks at magic numbers in memory. So... Yeah, let's do this. Luckily, it's a nice quick build. Okay. Let's write that and see what happens. And when we run it... Huh. That's not what I was expecting to happen. However, I do see that it's called our RS232 init function. So we have, as far as I can tell, enabled interrupts. So why hasn't anything happened? Have I got this the wrong way round? That is entirely plausible. I spent a lot of time fiddling with this when I was writing dbz tool, so I've got some handy code uh, here. And now we want this one. <laughs> Let's try that then, shall we? Yeah, what that was doing is skipping the read completely if there was any data. So that would have the side effect of clearing the interrupt because the FIFO was being read, but then discarding it. So we run it and now still nothing happens. That's annoying. Also, this was right the first time. Uh, because... Uh, so what this code is doing is uh, we want to, it wants to wait until uh, data is, is available. So it reads the register, checks to see if data is available. If it's not available, it jumps up to the loop. What we want to do here is to see if data is available, and if it's not available, uh, we break out of the loop and stop fetching data. So the only thing I can think of is that this b-test is assembling to the wrong thing. So let's just check that. Uh, doesn't say what size it is. Let's just put that L in. Okay, that is in fact the same instruction, so it was right the first time. So, if for some reason this is not actually reading any data, let us do our time-honored trick of uh, just dumping something to the console when the interrupt fires. That will give us a little bit more information about what's going on. Uh, B Q B L one B. Okay, so what does this do? 
Nothing. Interesting. So one thing that you can't see is that the serial converter module I'm using for this does actually have a light on it that blinks whenever data transfers. So I can see that uh, data is actually arriving at the converter module and therefore going to the board. So don't know why that is not firing. One thing I should do is figure out where the serial port is initialized. Is it before or after the vectors? I think it is after. Because remember the last time, the problem I was having with the timer, yeah, here is where the vectors are initialized. Here is where we were doing our machine initialization. And the serial port is way down here. So we know that the vectors aren't going to be fiddled with. I wonder if this might have halted disabling uh, interrupts entirely. As it, I would expect to get a message if it was panicking like that. Because of course, if the interrupts are turned off, then we won't, don't get any interrupts. I want to get that splash screen up and running. So why isn't it appearing? So this should be being set to true. Oh. It's not. This will be because uh, this command line setting is not being passed through to a hash define. Okay. Right, so let's stick that in our config. It's hitting the error. Okay, we should get the splash screen now. So let's try that. So if we run it, we now get the splash screen. Typing, aha! Right, that worked. Uh, and I just accidentally told it to boot from drive A. So if I reset the board, I mean, everything is still in memory now, so I don't need to run it again. I don't need to download it again. Now I can press escape. Interesting. Very interesting. We get one byte and it dies. That A is coming from our tracing here, so let's chop that out. Uh, we get our... Uh, 
So the GOT27 comes from Push Serial IO Rec. I'm still not convinced about this. Uh, I want to double check that. I need to find a nice simple example of passing a single parameter. Uh, this might do it. Aha, yes. Uh, yeah, I f so this is it's passing a it's pushing a word onto the stack. It then calls the subroutine and then retracts over the word it just pushed onto the stack. But what I am doing wrong is I'm expecting that everything is a four byte integer, which it's not. So what that is doing is moving the stack too far. This then jumps into garbage and the system crashes. So we build. Yep, that's done. Reset. Right. And with luck, it should now um, be closer to the state of nearly working. Right. So what do we got? Splash screen, escape to run the console, nothing's happened. But at least now we are getting, oh, I, yes. So we got serial input until I told it to boot and then it died. Good. Uh, serial stuff is, I believe, working. It's a shame that we're not actually Getting to a prompt. Probably because we don't have the drive. Well, I think I'm going to call the serial stuff done. And I think I we mean, now need to start looking at drives. This I was not really looking forward to. Uh, we need to uh, get the MMC and SD card module working. I'm just going to just remove the tracing. Actually, let me. I want to check stuff in now. So, so let's just turn off the various bits of tracing. Uh, we can leave that one. We can leave that one. Okay. All right. And now let's move on to the SD card stuff. So I did a bit of pre-work for this. So the first thing we want to do is to actually enable the SD module, which I believe is called SD. Nope. SDMMC. Comp with SDMMC, really? Ah, yes. So when we build this, 
it fails because the low-level SPI code that actually sends and receives data uh, have not been implemented. This is not actually particularly complicated. So we can look at uh, look for an example. Here we go. This is the cold fire version of the code, which is just setting a few registers, uh, sets up the sets the clock speed to various values. There's three different speeds we want to use: assert and unassert, the chip select line, send and receive bytes. That's it. 155 lines, quite a lot of which is. Uh, boilerplate. However, the SD card stuff on this device is a bit of a mystery. It's not the uh, the actual module because that is well enough documented. Uh, this system on a chip has got two SPI interfaces, one and two. Uh, two is much simpler than one. Uh, it's the fact that we don't know what else is wired up to where. So over here, I have Ghidra again with the Palmos ROM in it. And I did some poking around. To make an SD card work, there are three things you need. You need to power it. And this could be as simple as just connecting the power line up to the 3 4 uh, the power pin on the SD card up to the 3.3 volt line. You need to select it, which is done by inserting a chip select pin, which there is code here for doing. And then you need to read and write data. This device has hardware for doing the reading and writing of data, but the chip select stuff, I think, is done by just setting and unsetting various bits on various ports. So this is the chip select code decompiled. And we can see here that that parameter appears to be the uh, what drive you, you want. This parameter appears to be, as far as I can tell, what drive is currently asserted. No, it's not. That parameter appears to be whether you want it selected or not. And then it just sets or unsets particular bits. And I think that the first SD card slot is on PJ here, and the second is on PF here. So there's not actually very much of this code. Uh, can I change the type of this to something more useful? Retype to bool. So. What's this doing? Drive times 380. Uh, where are these registers? Nowhere near 380. Yeah, I think that's not relevant. So uh, it should just be a matter of configuring the unit, setting the appropriate bits, and then it works. However, the Parmos SPI code is absurdly complicated. It also supports SDIO, and it's got stuff in it like this, which is doing a whole pile of things. So I don't know what else is going on. It also appears that the second SPI interface is in use as well for something else. So I think we're just going to have to uh, suck it and see. So... Hmm. Anyway, as there's not a lot of code, let's just stick it in here. Uh, 
So what have we got in the way of functions we need to implement? SBI initialize. At least it's not interrupt based, which is nice. SBI clock SD. And the other thing is that Emutos does actually have all the uh, SD card driver high-level uh, high stuff. So all we need to worry about is sending and receiving bytes on the interface. It's worth pointing out that Emutos seems to only support a single SD card interface, and we have two. So I'm just going to make the first one work now, hopefully. And uh, I'll try to add support for the second one later. That will involve some core changes, so I don't want to get that mixed up with uh, the rest of this code. Okay, so we now have stubbed versions of all the SPI stuff. Okay, I think the easiest part is actually the send byte and receive byte things, because this is just a matter of writing to the appropriate register. So this should just be, we'll need a little bit more than this, but And the receiving register is RxD. Like, you know, that simple. Again, this has a pretty big FIFO, so we can keep receiving bytes without... Uh, we can send and receive bytes in chunks. But again, I am going to avoid doing any of that because that seems like work. So we also want to check to see whether data is actually available. This doesn't appear to be in the control register. This is the interrupt stuff. Here we go. Uh, RX FIFO data ready bit three. So SPI in CS. Uh, when set, one data word is ready. So while this is not set, Bin. Likewise, sending bytes. Um, while the FIFO is not, so while the FIFO is full, which is bit two, Bin. So this will wait until there's space in the outgoing FIFO for a byte, and this will wait until there is data in the incoming FIFO. Right, and this will fail to build because we haven't set the register values up here. SBI in CS is A word at 706. Uh, SPI RXD. is a byte 
that's 700, and SPITXD is a byte at 702. Okay, and if we look at the code, there should be very little of it. Receive byte, read register. Oh, that's interesting, I didn't know you could do that. Uh, test for zero, branch. Huh, that's, that's quite cunning. Uh, these two bits happen to correspond to particular bits in the condition code. So uh, it's managing, so it's loading the entire value into the condition code register and then using the branch that, that branches on the particular bit. So bit two here is the Z bit, so it does a branch if equal. Bit three here is the P bit, so it does a branch if uh, positive, I think that's what it means. P parity? I don't know, it doesn't really matter. Okay, interesting. Right, next, CS assert and unassert. Well, we have code here for doing it. So assuming that the first parameter here is the actual drive, then the bit we want is in PJ. So we should just be able to copy this piece of code intact. Although we can do better than eight. And this will therefore be that. Now, I'm hoping that, uh, yes, we need to figure out what PJ is. PJ data is 439. And it's a byte. Okay, and yeah, this is interesting. Uh, PJ is associated with various hardware modules on board. So, uh, this is in fact where the where SPI one is wired up, and by the looks of it, UART two. So the uh, our bit here is SS. However, the fact that we are setting that bit indicates it's being configured as a GPIO general purpose pin rather than SS. Uh, bits not to three control signals associated with SPI one. SPI one signals SS. Uh, slave select bidirectional signal output in master mode and input in slave mode. Uh, that is in fact the chip select line. But this seems to be doing it manually. So the second drive is on PF. So what's PF? Uh, is PF associated with any specific hardware? Yes, it is. That's bit two. Clock O. Yeah, that, that is obviously not being used by this. So it is set to a data bit. So I th uh, let's take a look at PJ again. 
because I need to make sure that PJ is correctly set as a um, as an output pin uh, as an output GPIO pin. So PJ dear and PJ cell are the ones we want, and possibly PJ UN to, for the pull up register. Now I did copy a lot of initialization code into my Dana init script here. So we can see here that PJ cell is being set to CF. Which here we go. C is one one o o f is one 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 one. So most of these being used as IO port function pins. But I don't know whether they get reassigned elsewhere in the ROM, so let's go and look at that. Okay, so PJ cell is this register and it is being written here. This is the init code that I copied. So here you can see uh, being the set to CF and then it's being read and written in quite a lot of other places. So what is this routine? Aha! Hardware SPI open. Let's yes, I did name it, but these trap instructions are confusing Gidra. So here it's fiddling with PD and here PF and PJ. You see, one of the things I'm a little bit concerned about is power. If the SD card's power pin is connected directly to the 3.3 volt rail, then everything's fine. Insert card, card goes on. But it's possible that this being a battery operated device, it's actually connected to a transistor somewhere and that transistor is controlled by a I.O. pin. So this could be powering on the card. So this is clearing the bottom four bits of PD. And if I remember correctly, zero means uh, internal dedicated function pins. So what are the bottom four, four bits do? Interrupts. So this is setting an interrupt on for GPIO pins. I wonder if that's supposed to generate a... Oh wait, I think I know what this is. This thing supports SDIO cards and I believe SDIO cards have an interrupt line. So I think that the, those interrupt lines are then routed onto the processor probably through here. I don't think we need to care about them. But this is setting a register I haven't looked up yet. F3OE F3OD Uh, F3OE is not a... Ah, yeah. Uh, F3OC is, I, is ISR, 
which is here. So in fact, if I tell this this is a 32-bit value, then I said a 32-bit value. Right, and then that then produces the right thing. So I am going to guess Uh, what's this doing? 314 ILCR which is a 16-bit register so I'm going to guess I don't need to touch any of that so I think that this is my initialization code so let's copy that and splat that in here. So uh, this is clearing the bottom two bits. What do the bottom two pits do? It also helps if I click on the appropriate thing. Uh, here we go. Mozzie and MISO, right, those are the data lines for the SPI interface. Uh, master out, slave in, and master in, slave out. And I would also expect it to be wanting to set data bit two is the clock line. I would expect that to be cleared too, to be honest. And I would ex then expect it to be explicitly setting the top bit. So where else is this being used? What's this? This also looks like initialization code. Prove SPI bus awake. There seem to be in, in the Palmos ROM several different things, several bit different bits of code that do the same thing. But honestly, this looks clearer and more correct. So you see, this is clear. No, hang on, PJ cell. This is. Setting the bottom four bits. Turning them into GPIOs. Yeah. PJ data or equals eight is then setting the top bit, which is chip select. Uh, that is actually unasserting the chip select line. Oh wait, there's more here. So this is setting the bottom three bits, then it sets the top, the bottom four bits. Yep, 
Yes, I am not. I don't know what that's doing. I think what I'm going to do is make some slightly educated guesses. This is looks like very similar code. It is, in fact, the same code. What's this one? Yet more initialization code. Prove SPI bus asleep. So I think this is power up and power down code. And it's turning off the SPI system. I think what we need to do is to basically try it and see, make some educated guesses about how things are supposed to work. So I think that these need to be, these three bits here need to be set to uh, dedicated I.O. Which is in the select register, it's a zero. And SS here needs to be a GPIO. So uh, So this uh, we want to make sure the SPI clock is So we want to be sure that the chip select line is zero before we do this to avoid accidentally enabling the device. We want to make sure that the direction of this is out. That's a one. And that is resetting the resetting the pull up register on our three SPI pins. And now we need to define these things. PJD cell is uh, there is no PJD cell. PJD is four three eight. PJ data is four three nine. PJ P Yuan is four three A.
and PJ cell is 43B. Okay, so that should be the pins initialized. Now we need to initialize the SBI system itself. So that is the control register. So let's go back to here, find SBI cont1, which as you can see, there's a lot of stuff going on. Sadly, a lot of this seems to be because this is pretty complex that their SBI code is pretty complex. So this is this is our sleep function. So th the this will actually be turning off the SBI system. Okay. What's this? Uh, hardware SPI exchange safe synchronous eight by RX. Now, one of the things that concerns me a little is I looked up the errata for this chip. And there's quite a lot of SPI errata. So this is writing FFs to the transmit FIFO. Yeah. And then it reads in eight values from the receive FIFO. I know what's going on here. This is because in order to do an SBI receive, you have to write an FF. These are all, uh, let's convert. These are all FFs. And the device will respond with its return parameter. So I bet that's what's going on there. Uh, what's this one? Hardware SPI clock. You haven't even started w working on the clock yet. So I think we'll need this code. Right, and oh, there's there's lots. Fabulous. Okay, what's this one? Hardware SBI exchange size. Okay, this is these are all configuring various parts of the SBI system. Yeah. Okay, let's go back to here and take a look at that clock code. So that's what we're going to have to do next. So the SPI clock is a line that alternates and one bit is transferred every time it pulses. There are three different clock rates that it can operate at, which is represented here in identification mode, which is dead slow, and all SBI devices support that. And then MMC and SD card modes, which are faster, different speeds. The idea is you set it to the ident mode, uh, which I think is 25 kilohertz. And uh, then you can talk to the device and figure out what it is and whether it is in fact a SD card. And then you crank the clock speed up. If we look at the 
this. So here, uh, here it's defining all the timings for the different speeds. So that's going to be, you know, fun. Yeah, it looks like the cold fires SPI stuff you can set various configurations, which it's doing here, and then tell it which one you want to use. But I don't think ours does that. So this is the data rate. And you know... Let's move this stuff up here so that's now going to set it's going to calculate the clock frequency on startup and then we can use it elsewhere so 33 mega uh, 20, 25 kilohertz is uh, slower than that Okay, well, we can set lots of this stuff anyway because they're obvious. So let's do that here. Uh, clock we're going to ignore for the time being. Data ready, I don't know about. SBI mode, we want to turn it we want it to be in master mode because it's controlling the transfer. So that is bit 10. Uh, SPI enable we want to be on, bit 9. Exchange. Inset while the exchange is in progress or SPI one. Um. So this appears to tell the SPI system in order to actually transfer data. It doesn't happen automatically when you put stuff into the FIFO. So on startup is going to be idle, but I think that here we need to set that bit. bit 8 polarity select I don't know about waveform select I believe is ignored because the the SS signal is not being used phase I don't know about polarity actually these both come from the SD card standard so we can look this up and bit count is the number of bits per transfer which is 8 
So we should be able to look at this code. Uh, this is actually disabling the FIFOs and not using them. Ah, oh, here are the speeds. Right, 400 kilohertz for identification mode, not 25. That's better. So... So we want to... Mask off the top three bits. So that's one FFF and or in the appropriate clock rate. So for 400 kilohertz, we want. 80, uh, 80 is not a valid value here, so the closest I think is 64, which gives us 500 kilohertz. So, likewise, MMC speed is 20 megahertz. Twenty E six is one point six. Uh, Right, the fastest we can go is divided by four, which is eight megahertz. So that's straightforward. Eight megahertz is like that. And again, the same thing for the SD card, because we can't go up to 25 megahertz. Right, and we need to define We need to rename syscont1 to svicont1 because that was a typo. And then we need to define the register. Seven o four. Okay, but we're still not ready because we need to set the other parameters. Uh, we need what's the polarity stuff? Does not actually appear to be here. Okay, so let's take a look at the vampire version to see if it says anything in here. Nope, nothing there. Ah, here are the speeds used for the vampire, so th all these speeds are kind of variable. Okay, I'm going to have to go look this up. 
However, there is one more thing we need to do, which is that in order to receive a byte, we need to uh, send an FF byte, which we're just going to do like this. And then the then assuming this works reasonably sanely, uh, the result will be clocked into the receive FIFO as this goes out. Let me just take a look at the overview. doesn't say much to be honest okay I am going to look up the uh, hang on a second so this should be being set somewhere in here like here this is supposed to be setting the clock speed and it's one of these loops that we saw to presumably determine what the appropriate value should be and this is basically the same code that I've got What's about here? Right, this is setting. Oops. This is setting the uh, the transfer bit to tell it to actually start an exchange. Yeah, here you can see it. It it writes a FF to the transmit FIFO. Uh, it engages the transfer. Then it keeps testing until the exchange stops, and then it reads the data out of the FIFO. I think that's similar to our code here. We will try it and see. Uh, I'm looking for the init code again. So this is clearing uh, D is one one zero one. So that's one one zero one. That is disabling the SPI unit because the system's going to sleep. So I would expect the next function to be hardware wake, to be honest. Yeah, but it hasn't been disassembled. I still haven't figured out what all these traps actually do, which is annoying. And also it doesn't appear to have touched the SPI registers. This appears to be power off, which is useful to know about.
Yeah, I am going to have to go look that up. So for SD cards, you want the uh, the clock to idle low, which is polarity zero, and uh, the output sampled on the leading edge, which is phase zero. So in fact, setting these two bits to zero does the right thing. So that's all we need. So I think we're probably good to go. I've also plugged cards into both slots. Uh, let's actually turn on tracing in the SD card module and yeah okay yeah so reset the board and we do a write and then we run it and see what happens okay so we run it I'm gonna be honest I fully expect this not to work. So, we did indeed see a uh, tracing appear in that it was failing to talk to the card slots. Um, I actually think I now want to disable this thing because it's clearing the screen and that's uh, meaning that I can't see the tracing. And let's fix those warnings. C operator precedence is weird and honestly not worth learning. Instead, you just put parentheses everywhere where it's not completely clear. Okay, let's try that again. Right. What have we seen? Uh, lots of failures. Um, see, I can't quite tell from the tracing whether it's actually successfully identified the card. There's not a lot of tracing here. This command not failed does look like it's bailed out immediately. If command not doesn't cause a switch. Probably no card, yeah. Okay, uh, right, it should show it should tell me that the card's been detected. Uh, SD receive data is here. Right. So this is just plainly not working. It's not contacting the card. Um, now this could be wrong, like backwards. Uh, the chip select line, see I did think that was active low. So, Uh, enabling it does, at least on the Arduino, 
Enable it, enabling it does appear to be clearing that bit. Wait a minute. I think that is backwards. Okay. Right. Okay, so now what happens? No. Well, that's annoying. Hope that would be an easy fix. So... So I am now wondering about power. Really, the next thing to do is to hook up the SD card pins to a logic analyzer. Um, and that will show precisely what's going on. Also, that number is wrong. It's 15 to 13. This should be a 13. So that won't have been, that will have been setting way too fast to clock speed for identification mode. The, it's possible that the card will still respond to that speed, but I have found that they can, they're kind of picky. It may even want this to be even slower. 64 miles per 13, that's wrong. That should be 4. Well, that didn't help for a start. So now when we run it, what happens? Still nothing. That's annoying. Uh, I am also I also don't know whether this is the this chip select line is connected up directly or whether it's via a inverter, so Uh, drives the output, output signal is high when, oh right, yeah, this is both input and output. So the, uh, yes, the, uh, a bit of one produces a high value. So, hmm. So this appears to be disabling the charger, which is also on port J, although it's not a bit we care about. Now get the charge. Oh, this is something we're going to want. Get the battery percentage. There's a quite a lot of code there, actually. Well, maths. Charger off, read battery level. Initialized battery, yeah, it's all battery stuff. So 
So this is where the this is one of the functions that claims to initialize the SBI stuff. So you can see it uh, clearing the bottom three bits. Uh, setting the top bit of the bottom word to an IO port, enabling it, disabling the UR, uh, the uh, pull up registers. Uh, we should probably, I think, clear the wait a minute, F7. Uh, that is only clearing the chip select line. So that's in fact setting it to off, not on. So let's try that. And again, this is, yeah, I was, I was getting my seven confused with a three here. Seven means all but the top bit. Three mean, not with, I'm getting my seven and my eight mixed up. Seven is all but the top bit. Eight is the top bit only. And when there's a an and in the mix, where this is specifying which bits to preserve and or is specifying which bits to set, it's easy to get them mixed up. I think this code down here is more to do with the second SPI interface. What function is this? Prov set pole zero. Prov SPI set pole zero. PD Hole. I wonder what the, the pol polarity register sets the input signal polarity of the interrupts. All oh, right, this was the. Th this is more to do with the interrupt handling, and I remember saying that. Uh, some of the bits of port D are, I think, to do with the uh, SDIO interrupt handling. So this is the code that I thought was doing the chip select stuff. So PJ If the second parameter is false, then set the bit, otherwise clear the bit.
Yes, yeah, so clearing the bit is unasserting it, assuming this is any sensible way around. So I think that this is correct. Uh, where is this being called from? Uh, this function is mislabeled. Hardware SBOCS set tunnel H. Uh. Okay, this thinks it's a thunk, which means a function that calls another function. Can I persuade it it's not? Well, I can change the name there, which is just as good. Okay. And it appears to be called from... Well, SPI close is probably going to uh, de-assert the drive. So that uh, is indeed uh, it's pushing a zero and then pushing D3 See, I wonder if that second parameter is not, in fact, a bool. So let's change that to a word. That is clearly garbage. Is this a, does it feel better if it's a byte? Maybe. Um, so this means that there's a parameter being passed into hardware SPI close that it doesn't know about. And it's this D3 value that comes from ah it's this zero here why is this setting zero to d3 twice and why does this think it's coming off the stack Ah, right, this is writing the value onto the stack. So we know it's a word because of this. Okay. So that is, in fact, a word. So... Yeah, but this code down here is assuming it's a byte. It's just interested in the bottom byte of it. So yeah, I think that is a byte after all. And there's something not quite right here. You see, this is not taking any parameters. Who's calling SPI close? 
unknown, it's going through a jump table. Blast. So, we are pushing a byte value and a word value in that order. So the word value is in fact the lower of the two in memory. It'll be this and this. IVA1 is uh, it's clearly a block of data that describes the drive status. And it's, it's probably checking to see if it's already been asserted. and then it's returning something okay that's not getting anywhere um, I have made some changes so let's just try this again I doubt it will make a difference. Okay, so we execute it, and yeah, it is failing in the same way as before. Interesting. Have, do we have something wrong in this code? Are we failing to send data correctly? Let's double check that. SPI int CS. So bit two is TF. Uh, TX FIFO full. Well, the bit when set indicates there are eight data words in the FIFO. We want to wait until it is empty. So while that bit is set, do nothing, and then set the transmit register value and tell it to begin an exchange. That seems reasonable. When we receive we send the byte and then we wait until bit 3 data ready is 1 and then return the value Alright, I think I am going to have to take the lid off this thing to expose the PCB and hook up the logic analyzer. Because the Palmos ROM doesn't contain uh, enough easily copyable pieces of code. There is a test register that tells you how much is in, uh, how full the FIFOs are. Uh, have I correctly told it it's an 8-bit device?
from TX FIFO to the shift register. The, the, the transmit register is an 8-bit uh, register. Data written to the register can be 8-bit or 16-bit size. The number of bits to be shifted out determined by the bit count setting in the SPI status control register. In slave mode, if no data is loaded... OK. Writes are ignored while SPI enable is clear. I think this documentation could be wrong, and this is actually a 16 bit register. So, should I be writing to address 703? You know, I'm just going to try this. Because the this code they're always reading and writing using word accessors. So let's just try that. OK, and again, nothing. All right, I am going to pause and take this thing apart. So unfortunately, I seem to have lost my logic analyzer. It is tiny and looks like a USB key, so it's probably some under something on my desk, so that's not helpful. However, I did take the opportunity, since the lid was open, to do some uh, trace following, and I discovered a number of interesting things. One of which is that the power lines are not connected directly to the 3.3 power rail. In fact, they appear to go to a transistor, which is then connected to additional ports on the system. So as I thought, it does appear to be explicitly powering on the card. And looking at the pinout, this seems to be connected to PB5. That is a uh, bit 5 of port B. And if I find that that is this one. And over here in the disassembly, in the private SPI bus awake function, I can indeed see it fiddling with port B. So I think this is powering on the card. So let us simply copy this over to our SPI initialize. like so. And of course this won't build because I need to add all the various ports. Uh, PB data is 409. PB Dear is 408. Uh, PB Yuan is 
is 40A PB cell is 40B. Okay, so with luck, that should power on the card. And PB, P, port B, P, Ewan. So we'll see what this does. And of course, now the lid's off, I can actually check the voltages. Ah, uh, that's interesting. My terminal up here has... Failed. Okay. Um, that is plugged in. Oh, I actually forgot to plug in the Dana itself. Be right back. Okay, I have uploaded the binary and run. And of course it's not working. And because I powered off the machine, we now get this. So let's try and boot from... Okay, it booted automatically. All right, uh, I'm going to check the various power voltages and see if the card is powered up. Yes, it is. Uh, the correct card is... Well, one of the cards is powered up. And... Let me think. I think that is, in fact, the incorrect card is powered up because, of course, I have flipped the, the, the I flipped the machine over to get at the bottom. So the card on the left is powered up, but I think my chip select line is pointing at the card on the right. Um, that was. So I think PJ is the one on the left, and PF was the, well, PJ was, okay, I am completely got my cards mixed up, but I think, I Actually, I do not need to know which card is which. I just need to make sure that my power on bits and my chip select bits are the right ones. And this is indeed, here are all the PJ bits and here are the PB bits. So I think that's right. Uh, is the chip select the right way round? Well, when we assert it, we bring it low, and when we unassert it, we bring it high. And I can indeed see that it is high. Is there anything more that needs set in the control register? Well, let's have a quick look. So data rate is set here. Data ready, I don't believe we care. Mode select is master. Enable. No exchange, polarity low. Well, that's polarity of SS that we're not using, so we don't care. Waveform select SS, we don't care. Uh, we could connect this up to the chip select line. That, I believe, is what it's for. But, of course, it will only connect it to one of the cards. 
phase and polarity Wait a minute. zero active high polarity zero is idle is that correct clock polarity the clock idles low and the output is sampled in the leading edge yeah, okay so the clock is active high and the only other thing remaining is the bit count which should be 8 over here I have yet to find anybody who's actually setting SPI cont outright wait a minute that's the wrong control register that is cont2 we want cont1 but I suspect that's interesting I did did I define SPI cont1 have I been looking at SPI cont2 the whole time Why is PB data here at 7.03? Cont 1 is at 7.04, which is here. Okay, odd. I must have accidentally overwritten that somewhere. Okay, that looks more like it. This is the code that modifies the clock. So you can see it read the old value, whoops, mask it or in the new value and write it back again with interrupts off we should probably be doing that uh, this one Let's start to command That start to command, start to command, more starting of commands than when we looked at this one. Start to command, you all start commands. This is unsetting some bits. What is this? This is the wake up, no, it's the sleep routine. So, yeah, I uh, looked at this before. One, one, zero, one. It's unsetting the enable bit. Again, I would expect that hardware awake. Which is less easily found should be setting that but it doesn't be but I remember that it doesn't seem to be hardware wake is that that is incorrectly named ah no no there's a, this function starts here this is correctly named prove wake up int handler.
this is hardware wake. So are there any references as I can see to the SPI stuff? Well, unless it's in here, that looks SPI-ish. This also doesn't have any um, symbol names. So I think that means it's all logically part of this. I think these names refer to modules. So I think this is doing something like that. But that setting up the second SPI device, which we don't care about. And I think that's it, really. Somebody should be initializing this. And one thing I can do is to grope through memory and look for F704. And it will be aligned, so here's a reference. I don't think this might not be code. That does not look like code. Fortunately, because instructions on the 68,000 are variable length, finding the beginning of an instruction isn't entirely obvious. That does look like code. So this is, looks like lots of SPI code. Let's see if I can find the top. Here it is. That was my multimeter turning itself off. Good. There is quite a lot of this function, I have to say. I think that's data. It does look like code. It is referred to as data labels. And still there's no sign of a symbol at the end table I 
I think this could be a complicated SDIO driver of some description. Because that, that would explain why it all seems to be compiled into a single module. There's, there's a lot of different subroutines all uh, glomped together. And there should eventually be a name that def describes it. I did spend some time going through looking for uh, the trap handler and it's all indirected through stuff that's not code which makes it, here we go, that's, a, that's not a symbol name it's all indirected through vectors that make it very hard to trace So I haven't been able to figure out what any of these system calls actually do. I think this is all ebook reader stuff, to be honest. Um, but we can see that it is. What's this doing? Uh, load the interrupt handler, shift it left, and write it back again. That makes no earthly sense. It's possible that what I have here is not code and it's just very code like garbage. Yeah, this is doing the same thing with SPI cont. Uh it could be that the uh that Gidra has it tries to infer the values of registers. So it thinks that this is a It thinks that A5 has the right value to be uh, referring to that register. And if it's got that wrong for some reason, which it might do, A5 is being used in a lot of places. Yeah, I think A5 is actually the global pointer f for the workspace for this particular module, and that is a completely spurious... Uh, memory search and that's not actually valid likewise there likewise there Yeah, that hasn't helped. Okay, I am... Um, well, we've powered on the card, and I think I'm doing the chip select stuff right. So, I really am going to need the logic analyzer for this bit. So I suppose I'll just go and have to have another look. 
It was on my desk the whole time. Anyway, I found it, I plugged it in, I've wired it up, I have an image downloaded and ready to go. So let's hit the run button and execute and stop. And what do we have? Well, I'm just trying to remember what everything is hooked up as. So D0 is MISO, uh, master in slave out. This is the response from the uh, card. So we are getting something. Not quite sure why. D1 is the clock. Let's Let's uh, rename some of these. So this is when the, the machine is trying to talk to the card. It runs the clock, obviously enough. Right, D2 is, right, the orange wire is connected to CS. Which shows up as red in this, of course. That is wrong. CS should be. Is that wrong? So CS starts its life as low. We see it go high. Uh, we then see it go low again, which should enable the card. The card is then... Oh yeah, and then this one, of course, is Mozzie, Master Out, Slave In. So this is the machine talking to the card, and this is the response coming back. So it does look like we're getting something out of the card. So for a start, I think we want this, I think we want CS to be high to, to begin with. Then it will be brought low when the, when we want to talk to the card and then brought high again once we finished. Uh, if I zoom out, you can see here, it gives up, brings it high, uh, and then has another go. Now, I will turn off some of the things I'm not using to make the screen a bit more clean. And let's try and add a decoder. SD card SPI mode. And it will auto detect things because of the names I gave it. So here we should be able to see what's actually happening. Oh, this window's too small. So, right, card select goes high, and then we see Mozzie data. Uh, really? See, I would expect 7F92800002. That looks like garbage, to be honest. Now, it might be a low resolution in the capture, but we've got reasonable... We've got a number of data points per clock tick. Yep, 
it's detected all the lines properly chip select is active low So if we go and look at the SD card code, so this is where it's initializing the SD card. You can see here it unasserts the chip select line and then we spam bytes and then assert it. That will reset the card. We then send a command with, not sure what that is, but we should see it in the data stream. So it could be this, it's unasserted, but then nothing happens for a bit and then it's asserted and then things start happening. Uh, 74 dummy cl clocks with CS high see this does not look like seventy four clocks to be honest. We are seeing that the clock rate is uh, is that anything resembling? Oh no, that's not the clock rate, that's the length of the area I have selected. So let's add another decoder. We should be able to do frequency. Hello, how do I add it? Oh, it's now showing up. Okay, so I need to assign S clock. And we can see 250 kilohertz which is eventually what I ended up with. So the clock looks right. So I wonder whether these transfers are garbage. I think I'm going to rerun it now that I've changed the sense of this. So I have set this, I have set GPIO3 to be uh, a GPIO, not the internal clock. So that should be okay. Okay, well, let's try this again at a higher frequency and at a higher sample rate rather 
and see what comes out. Okay, so execute, well, prepare for execution, run, hang on, 2 megahertz, run, go, stop. Right, what did we get? CS goes high. Mm, that doesn't look like a good waveform. I have actually had problems with with this before with trying to signal analyze SD card traffic and I was seeing very much the same sort of thing so I wonder if my incredibly cheap and nasty uh, signal analyzer is in fact doing a bad job So it's it has decoded a command, but the card is is clearly garbage. And the card is Oh that that's bad. That looks that looks like it's replying, but it really isn't. So this reminds me very much of the problems I was having with trying to get the SD card to work on Fusix with the Pico ESP8266. And I can't remember what the actual solution was. It was all a little while ago. This doesn't look at all right. I mean, what we should be seeing is uh, a command zero followed by uh, let me see, command zero does not have the value zero. Yeah, this is the ghastly state machine for initializing SD cards. So command zero is in fact zero. The argument is zero and the CRC is 94. So we should see zeros in the 94. Are we? Nope. So it's failing, it's refusing to decode that at all. I turned ship select off to make it a bit more promiscuous, but... No, that's just not working. Flipping the bit order doesn't do anything useful. Hmm. Okay, well, honestly, I think I've done enough for today and I need to go and do some research, by which I mean I need to go and go through my old videos to figure out 
how I got round the similar looking problem last time because I think it might be the same problem this time if all else fails we could just bit bang the SD card interface all these things are showing up on pins that we can convert to GPIOs but that shouldn't be necessary yeah I am puzzled also we can get rid of that because we don't need it anymore Okay, uh, I'm going to go do some more research and then come back next time with hopefully a solution. Yeah, these two sessions have not been that productive, to be honest. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video and please let me know what you think in the comments.